and um, I think we can get started. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, first of all, thank you everybody for taking the time to spend with us today. I think, I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy the discussion. Um, we had a parallel conversation to this this morning and um, we got some thank yous afterwards. So I think there's certainly, I, I think um, it's, we're, we're here to pick your brains and to find learn from your experience, but I think there's also something to be learned from one another. So um, I'm glad you're here. And um, I think, as you know, some of you have been involved in other of our stakeholder activities, either through workshop attendance or online or real or filling out questionnaires for us and so on. And um, it's a huge part of what we're doing within the project. So it's really valuable to us and we appreciate you taking the time now. We're getting closer to the end of our project. Actually, it's just a few months away now. I can't believe the time has gone so quickly and um, working on some of our final project deliverables. And this is in the direction of recommendations and roadmaps and how things should be done based on the experience we gain within the project. And, um, what we're looking at today is conflicting interests. So um, we have here from you, representatives of the public and the private sector, all working in different ways around uh, new mobility issues. And so it's a chance for you to also hear from the other side, I'll say the other side, about what their issues are. And we'll try and bring those points out in the discussion questions that we've got coming up. Um, I would like to maybe start with just a really quick round of hello, this is my name and this is the organization I'm from, if that's okay with everybody. It seems like I could, it looks like I've got the only, there we got a few cameras going. I'll just go through things in the order that I see them in. Um, Pedro, I'll start with you. We'll come back to you again afterwards, but since you're next to me there, I'll start with you. Do you want to tell us who you are and where you're from? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Pedro Almeida de Gouveia. I'm from the Policy Network. I'm the Senior Policy and Project Manager here. I'm also running the uh, coordinating work on governance and integration and on safety and security. I'll be facilitating the discussion this afternoon. Yes, thank you, Pedro. Christophe, what about you? So, hi, my name is Christophe Arnaud. I am the CEO of Blue Systems Smart Mobility. Uh, it's a subsidiary of the Bolloré Group. Uh, and uh, within uh, this uh, specific subsidiary, we are providing cities with uh, data aggregation tools and platforms uh, to allow them to better monitor and uh, also regulate uh, uh, all type of mobility operations that uh, can be micromobility or uh, buses, taxis, uh, ride hailing, uh, delivery bots, uh, things like that. Okay. I think some of your data knowledge might come in handy here today. Martin, what about you? Okay, I'm Martin Roelev. Um, I work with Ustra, which is a public transport operator in the city of Hanover that you can see right <laughs> behind me. Um, so, and then also I'm active in the VDV, the German Association of Public Transport Companies and, and the UITP. So I'm the vice chair of the Combined Mobility um, Committee. And um, also I work part-time as a consultant for new mobility solutions and digital uh, mobility solutions. Okay. And I'm a fan of shared mobility and connected. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the right place then, glad you're here. Tamas? Hello, my name is Tamas Ramos. I'm working on the strategic department of uh, BTT, the Public Transport Authority of Budapest. Nice to have you here. Ping Jen. Yeah. Hello, I'm Ping Jen. I'm a research fellow at University College London, and uh, I work for the Giga Project and specialize in business model innovation for new mobility services and the technologies. And we'll hear from you again in a minute. Thanks, Ping Jen. Yeah. <laughs> Pasquale. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Pasquale Cancellara. I'm project manager at the Policy Network, and uh, I will be helping um, Pedro today to take some notes uh, while we discuss together. Thank you. Caroline? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Caroline Busquet. I'm working at Apsiski, which is an innovation consulting company, and I work uh, on the JECO project. Thank you. Marisa? Hello everybody, I'm Maria Sameta from Fit Consulting I'm also, and I am also part of the JECO project. Thank you, Valerio. 
Yeah, here we are. I am Valerio Lubello from uh, Bocconi University, Department of Law. And we are here trying to find a um, uh, solution for the mobility, uh, urban mobility. Okay. That's all. Bad time for a phone <laughs> call. You were distracted. Okay, thanks. Vasilis? Hello. I guess Hi. you can see me, and uh, I'm Vasilis Agridas, I'm from uh, Airbus Urban Mobility, also leading the Urban Air Mobility Initiative, and contributing here from the third dimension. <laughs> Thank you. Yannick. Hello everyone, I'm Yannick Busse from UITP. Um, I'm working in the uh, Mobility Governance Unit within UITP, and I'm also the coordinator of the Gecko project. Thank you. And Giant? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Giant, and I'm from uh, Confederation of Organizations in Road Transport Enforcement, and uh, we are also working for the implementation of the Gecko project. Thank you. And the last one, it says just Zieleros Hyperloop, but I'm assuming that's Juan behind that. Yeah, hello. My name is Juan Vicen, and I am the co-founder and chief marketing officer at, at Zieleros Hyperloop. We are a Spanish company developing a scalable Hyperloop transport system for intercity mobility at zero emissions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going to go into discussion. In a few minutes, we'll be asking for your views. Um, on a set of questions that we've set up. But before we do that, we will um, we'd also like to share some of the information and the learning that we've developed through the project over the last few months. And um, we'll have Ping Jun doing that for us from University College London, as he said, who will um, describe a little bit about business models and um, new mobility services from the, yeah, from the, the, the business perspective. So Ping Jen, yeah. I'll turn it over to you for the next few minutes. And then if there are questions for that, we'll take those afterwards. Okay, yeah, thank you. So uh, I will share my screen now. Yeah, it's not mine. <laughs> 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 yeah, although I want to close it, but it's not mine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, you need to make me as a hoster. Otherwise, I wouldn't present. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Hello, can you see my screen now? Yes. Can you? Can you? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming for this stakeholder workshop. So this presentation really is uh, we want to show you our findings from work package one regarding the new mobility services and the technologies. So in the work package one, we, we review a lot of new mobility services and technologies, and we categorize all these innovations into four different categories. As you can see in the screen, the category one is the connected cooperative and automated mobility, which we cover a lot of things such as connected and auto automated vehicles, drones and less mile deliveries. A second category is infrastructure network and traffic management, which we cover especially in big data, in traffic management and hyperloop. Then we have mass and mass platform. And we also have shared on demand mobility, such as ride hailing, bike sharing, and other kind of micro mobilities. And the least innovation category is further be investigated by different kind of factors. So 
we explore the technological factors, operational factors, social factors, and also business factors. And other relevant factors such as security, cyber security, safety, all these factors are invented to explore how then how these factors in influence the, the implementation of new mobility services and technologies. And you can find more details of our works in Deliver 1.1 and Deliver 1.4, which is already uploaded on our, our official GECO website. After reviewing these new mobility service and technologies, we also investigate the business models and, and also how to transform the current business model into a sustainable one in order to correspond to the future trend of, of this uh, uncertainty feature. So as you can see, we investigate the value proposition and we also try to explore how the value that the firm proposed can be delivered and also how the value can be captured by their cost structure and the revenue stream. And the, the more detail can be found in Deliver 1.2. Moreover, we also look into the end user's perception and the mobility need of these innovations. So for example, if we see connected and automated vehicles, we can find that the benefit of this innovation is we can improve safety and the reliability. And we also increase the accessibility for people that they are not able to drive conventional vehicles. And this kind of innovation can save time. And we also can allow the people to spend time on other activities when they are in the vehicle. However, the drawbacks is that it will increase societal expectation of how to spend the free time and it might increase the price of the car and also potential for motion sickness. And there is also a chat to the privacy issue and about the hacking of the vehicle. Because all this infrastructure and the innovation are really data driven. So the data issue is really a key for this innovation. And we are now trying to finalize this level and this level 1.3 will come in soon on Gecko website probably on May. So in addition to this levels, we also collect some insight from previous two workshops. And we use a, a scenario called Green Future Scenario to, to explore how the public sectors and also how the firm should respond to uncertainty trend in the future. And what we found is that the firms and the public sectors need to make changes and uh, they also need so, some support from public sectors. So there are nine different changes and support that we need from based on the workshop findings. The first one is the top-down approach. So in the future, we might need more top-down approach given that everything is more automated and interconnected. However, the challenge is how can we deal with the top-down approach for, because some firms, especially for firms that they, they uh, create dis disruptive innovations, they need more flexibility, which might conflict with the top-down approach. And this also, actually also correspond to our workshop topic today, the conflict interest. And for the public education, we might need more support for public education to persuade 
citizens to adopt new mobility services and other te and technologies for the environmental purpose. However, it might not always be an effective way because the citizens we will also expect that what are the econ economic benefits for them to adopt these innovations? And the third one is the public-private partnership model. So we, the city might need to make sure that the collaboration between them and the private firms is profitable and sustainable. Otherwise, it really will be difficult for the collaboration and promote these new mobilities and these technologies. Another change in the suppose is that we might need a B2G data platform to ensure data sharing is smooth and data sharing is secure. The challenge is the lack of capacity for cities and public transport operators to use the data. So how to deal with the data sharing and API issue is also a key challenge in the future especially like we just mentioned before, that all this innovation is really data-driven and we rely a lot on the data. And uh, also we might need more B2G agreement, which is also a contract. We might need more negotiation between the government especially if the government adopts a top-down approach, we might need to notice that uh, the negotiation power between the private firm and the public sector need to be more attention. So for example, if a private firm provides uh, an innovation, uh, innovative services in a city, the government might also as to cover the remote area, then this is a problem of uh, how, how should we make the business model sustainable for the private firm and what kind of support and agreement need to be negotiated between them. And the next one is the transparent and well-established data policy. Like we mentioned before, the data is a key. Then another, the, the final three changes is the urban space subsidies and also environmental footprint. So the first one, urban space is, why would, uh, the key change is, why would the cities or the public sectors, they provide space for business that make money. So what's the benefit for the public sectors and how can the private sector prove that there is a benefit if they use more urban space or they, they try to get the urban space from the public sectors. And another is the subsidies for peripheral transportation. So it's, it's more easy to understand that the disruptive innovations can benefit the central area of the city but also we need to allow that uh, the peripheral area or more remote area, they also benefit from such innovation, then the subsidies from the city will be more important and be a strong support for firms to promote their innovations in all national areas. Finally, the, there is also might be a charge of environmental impact in the future. And it's important to set up the standards of different innovations for environmental footprint across cities and the regions. However, how can we ensure the fairness of this kind of standard is also an issue because all these changes and the support have a different conflict and the benefit 
So it might benefit for some parties, but also it might create some barriers for, for other firms or other parties that want to engage the transformation to, uh, to achieve uh, sustainability goals. So it's really our finding shows that there are different, different kinds of conflict that need to be solved. Yeah, so this is my presentation to give you some initial idea about what will be the potential conflict. And I hope this presentation will facilitate your discussions in the next session. Yeah. So if you have any question, please feel free to mention. Otherwise, I will let Bonnie to continue. Thanks, Ping Jen. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions directly to Ping Jen about his presentation? which is also completely fine. You're welcome to come back later with questions if you happen to have them to, to that particularly, and you can, you'll have access to the, the deliverables that, that Ping Jen is referring to that this information um, comes from. Let's say I have a question, may I? Yeah. May I? <laughs> Go ahead, Pedro. <laughs> Ping Jen, so um, it's a very interesting presentation. So you basically, you look, you look over, you know, different uh, business models um, mm -hmm. for the private sector. Is the, is the public sector entitled to have a business model? Yes, yeah, so of course, uh, the public sector also have their own business model and which is more complicated because they need to balance between different departments and to minimize the, the conflict. Mm -hmm. um, however, our analysis is more focused on private sectors and uh, really is really based on the firm level analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because for a business model, you, you, you need to, business models are only for those who seek profit or mm -hmm. would, you, would um, you say that for the public sector, it doesn't make any sense to have Quite a no, business model. maybe not a different really, model, something different. Because uh, the business model, there is also non-profit business model, which more focus on the social value and the environmental value. Mm -hmm. But of course, the pub, even the public sector, they need to make sure their business model works and is sustainable, which will also refer to the economic value. But they will always say that they will prioritize their social and uh, and also the environmental value and more minimize the financial value, which is not completely true because we always try to make something more sustainable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's a good point. And uh, maybe it's also a good topic to discuss later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we can open up another uh, discussion area because <laughs> it's not that we don't have enough to talk about let me tell you yeah. um, thanks Pin Jeng for sharing that with us um, what I'm going to do now basically is turn the floor over to Pedro who as he said is from Polis and is mm -hmm. responsible for um, the document that um, the information today will be feeding into. So we said that we're talking about conflicting interests. Um, I guess I'll just give it to you, Pedro. You can describe what's going on. I've put the link to the Miro board in the chat so you can use that as you see fit, but I'll just yeah. turn it right over to you. Then you can share the, the screen uh, when you want. Maybe just give me a couple of minutes for, before sharing the screen. So uh, thank you for thank you all for participating. Thank you, Ping Jen, for setting the scene. Um, we will have over the next hour a uh, facilitated discussion. I'll be your facilitator, and my colleague uh, Pasquale Cancellara will be uh, the annotator. He will be uh, taking notes of uh, what you say. Uh, we will have a mirror board. Uh, you know, it's one of those uh, online uh, flip charts. Maybe Bonnie or Pasquale, you can share it right now. Um, you, Pasquale uh, and Bonnie will be taking notes there. Um, if you want to, uh, you will find the, the, the links to the Bureau Board on the chat box. And you will also find it's Gecko Project below, Gecko Project is the uh, password to enter this middle board. 
you can you have the choice of uh, you know just participating focusing on the discussion and uh we will be taking notes if you also wish to add your own notes i mean we will be taking notes about what you say obviously if you want to add your own notes uh please feel free to do so just use the link uh log in with the password and add your own notes as we discuss um so the goal of this for the goal of this discussion what's the purpose it serves um, so the the gecko project yes bonnie sorry just two quick points before you get any farther i realized that the recording started automatically when the meeting opened um yeah. so i just want people to be aware that we are recording this it's not going anywhere beyond um into our notes for the project um, deliverables but you should be aware of that and the second thing i just noticed that chrissy is also here and i just wanted to give one more quick introduction introduction to um chrissy from next bike who has just joined us here if you want to show your camera maybe chrissy and just <laughs> we can see that you're out there that's super sure hi i'm here nice to have you okay okay pedro back to you thanks yeah okay so um so this is about the process so i'll be facilitating and uh pasquale and everybody else who wants uh, will be annotating um about the the goal of this discussion so uh the gecko project you know has come up with several uh research deliverables um and it will have to also deliver uh, a, a set of guidelines that can inform public authorities, namely the local, regional, and metropolitan transport, transport authorities and governments, uh, about how to deal with the disruptive innovation in the transport sector. And so what we're looking for with this discussion is, let's say, what we cannot get from this uh, literature and uh, literature reviews and science research is, you know, it's your uh, advice, your insights, uh, your free opinions. So it's pretty much a structured, but as informal as possible um, discussion. So feel free to share. Everything's being recorded, but we will keep the recording with us. We won't share it with anybody. And uh, it's just for the purpose of, uh, of note taking. Um, and so feel free to, 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 to share, to, to think out loud and share your thoughts uh, as much as you want. Um, on, uh, the, um, on the topic, so um, the, 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 key, the key challenge that uh, public uh, authorities at the local and regional level face is that we have a decade, this decade, to achieve a massive shift towards sustainable uh, mobility. And as, as I said, it's only one decade uh, and we have to uh, make the most. Obviously the public sector can't do it by itself. It certainly can, cannot do it against the private initiative. Rather the real challenge here is to uh, channel and you know ride on the energy of the private sector um, to create the options, the mobility options that we need, and to, and to bring in the innovation to the transport sector that we need. Now, it's a bit like somebody has said. It's a bit like riding an elephant. Uh, you can't. I mean, you have to nudge the elephant, and you have obviously to be careful on you know where the elephant steps so it doesn't break stuff. Um, and so we will be uh, discussing. Uh, four important issues. These issues may sound familiar to you. Some of them are you know, absent from most of the discussion regarding mobility innovation, but they're very important for public authorities and we want to hear your thoughts about them. So we will be approaching four issues, one at a time. We will discuss around 10, between 10 to 15 minutes uh, each uh, issue. And the discussion of each issue will revolve around three questions. What are the, where are converging interests between the public and the private sector? Where are conflicting interests between the public and the private sector? And what advice would you like to share with those on the front line? So I will be posting the issue on the chat box in a few seconds. And I would invite you to check the chat box in a few seconds when I'll tell you, you know, just reflect in silence for some maybe some 20, 30 seconds, and then we will start the conversation, try to be brief and to the point as possible so that as many uh, of us can talk. So here's the first issue, encouraging active mobility. Walking is the most environmental friendly mode of transport with cycling a close second. We need to transport to reduce transport carbon emissions but in our sedentary society, we also need more active mobility. 
to improve physical and mental health. Now, uh, walking um, is it the source of for, for those who are about you know looking for ways to 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 implement lucrative um, new mobility services? I mean, is walking and cycling good for them? Where are the converging interests? Where are the conflicting interests? Uh, and what advice do you have for the for, for those on the front line? So let's wait a few seconds, and then I'll start squeezing your brains. And since I have the list of participants, I now can go one by one. <laughs> Sorry, I, I may have missed this, but in terms of um, on the those on the front line, what do you mean by front line? Well, I would say that expression to include uh, those who are working on uh, city administrations, regional administration, metropolitan transport authorities, but also those who are launching new bike sharing uh, services on, on cities, for example. Those who are directly involved in, uh, in policy making and in you know, bringing in new mobility services to urban areas and beyond. So, but is the advice then for the public sector basically, Pedro? No, for both. Okay. For those, uh, for those who have their hands on, Christina. So that's kind of a very broad understanding. Okay. Would somebody like to start? Um, I'm happy to, to jump in. Um, so hopefully I've understood this correctly, but I think uh, one of the conflicting interests um, oftentimes is space. So um, when you're creating space, for example, for bike share or other micromobility um, services, oftentimes um, depending on, on the, the city or, or how the structure of the, the city, um, that space is taken away from, or it can be taken away from pedestrians as opposed to taking it away from um, cars. Is that kind of what you were looking for? Pedro, are you there to be heard? Yeah, Pedro, probably you can reconnect your your headphone. We seem to have lost you, Pedro, at least your voice. <laughs> I kind of don't think he's hearing us either. Yeah, no, he couldn't hear us. <laughs> But he's looking very thoughtful. Can somebody maybe will, I think it's just as if people bring him back again. But I mean, I, just to answer your question, <laughs> can I, say, I would say certainly that would be a part of it. The space issue um, and you speaking from your, the public bike share, particularly if you're taking space. But did you say from pedestrians or, I mean, you could also be taking space from cars, no? Yeah, yeah, I suppose it's just, uh, if we're talking specifically about pedestrians and cyclists, um, there could be a scenario where it could cause conflict if the space, um, if space has not been allocated to um, cyclists on street and cyclists um, either don't have space on street and therefore ride on the sidewalk um, because they're scared, um, or the city has designated a bike lane in essence on the sidewalk, which takes away, takes away space from pedestrians. Yep, I would say that certainly. So I'll just take over a little bit from Pedro until he reappears again. <laughs> that could be, I was, I was thinking from your perspective, um, Chris, yeah, that I could imagine the converging interests here most certainly between um, the public and the private sector in that I mean, what you do with a bike share system also encourages or makes it more possible for for people to <laughs> to cycle so i would put you down i would say in both places at the same time 
Yeah, you're the glass half full and I'm the glass half empty. You know. <laughs> Pedro, you're muted now, but can you hear me again? Yes, uh, I'm sorry, I had to go out. My computer is on stupid mode today. I don't okay. know what happened. <laughs> uh, so stupid mode is my default mode. I was hoping the computer would be better. So um, I lost everything till now. So good thing that it's recorded. <laughs> And could somebody pick it from here, please? I'm very sorry. Yeah, no, we had Chris's point, and she was just sort of confirming that, that we were, she was talking in the direction that you were thinking about this. Um, the one point was the reallocation of space for, I mean, you said bike share, but I would say also e-scooters or any other form of new mobility that could be taking away public space. I mean, ideally, it wouldn't be coming from pedestrian space, but rather from car space, but um, that certainly is a possibility. And then um, I gave, or Krishna said that I have the glass half full because I was seeing the converging interest between the public and the private sector, particularly with bike share in that um, that is a new mobility mode. So sharing bikes mm -hmm. um, that um, certainly could serve to support the idea of more walking and cycling taking place. Okay, more views on this. Thanks, Bonnie. And thanks, Christina. <laughs> well, let me spike your interest. So everybody says that there's a lot of uh, space for uh, new mobility services to come and fill in the first and the last mile. Well, what if I told you that maybe the first and the last mile should be walk and bike? Then how do you see all this issue? Then what's the space then for uh, new mobility services to, to come in? I mean, is there a conflict there? Your turn. Martin, does this make sense, sense for yeah. you or not at all? <laughs> um, yeah, I think there are, there are always the, the two models. So one is uh, that that is first and mile uh, solutions for, for uh, to extend public transportation, but also there's a, the classical uh, multimodal approach that that you have choose either between this mode or that mode, and I think so. Um, active mobility is is I think the the best first mile, first mile and last mile solution for public transport because you usually you walk to the next station or the second best mode is to take the bicycle or the equal <laughs> good mode to do because you you um, enlarge the catchment area um, by a lot uh, by using bicycle and also maybe a scooter could could be helpful but mm, so I think that's mostly the converging interests um, with um, to to encourage um, active mobility will also encourage the use of public transportation but then there are certain some use cases probably where it could be alternative so that uh, biking could lure away customers from public transportation so that's but but i don't think that's a real threat so so in my view it's it's more converging interests because a, a bicycle friendly city is also a, usually a public transport friendly city or a, a low uh, auto use uh, city so what I had is so the the converging thing for me is uh, that that all these public and private um, actors have the same idea of uh, transforming the city from from the car oriented to more um, cycle friendly, walking friendly, and so to, towards a green uh, city. Mm -hmm. So that's converging for me, and. Maybe there might be a little bit of a conflict uh, in terms of, of subsidies or public money, because we have to decide if you spend money on on either cycleways or on subsidizing a, a, um, a bike sharing scheme or subsidizing public transport. So it's it's just you you got every euro only one time, and you have to decide so what what you spend it on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Does anybody else want to add something? Christoph, does this make any sense to you? Yes, no, no, it is. Um, I mean, 
I have a, a few uh, a few ideas. I was trying actually to write something. Um, so, with regards to encouraging active mobility, there there is this uh, this data sharing somehow needs uh, that 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 some cities may 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 ask to provide or in exchange of getting a permit. So, uh, in if 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 the data is not that crazy and more attached to the vehicle, it's 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 pretty converging. But um, we are facing right now some cities that would like to to have some 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 more data, uh, and and here I'm talking about user ID, uh, uh, gender, zip code, where they are living, and I understand why cities would like to know that because they think way bigger than only uh, providers here. But providers, they 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 here. This is crazy, a conflicting uh, a discussion that 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 can see and 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 that I can I can uh, I, I'm assisting right now actually uh, when when it's dealing with okay, uh, do you want to share that kind of of some some private uh, 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 or more uh, more uh, private uh, data so. So that that we, we we can add something like this here uh, uh, in terms of data sharing. Um, there are also the policies. Policies. Uh, I mean, all cities uh, cities would like to actually uh, uh, promote and support equity in terms of accessing their market to actually support and and operate properly and and offer uh, a, a real public service, despite the fact that it may be maybe maybe uh, uh, managed by by a private company. Uh, so. Um, once again, uh, it's there are some converging interests when you're discussing with challengers. When you're discussing with the big operators, uh, here we, uh, you, you, we see some conflict sometimes uh, between uh, a, a city or, or providers. Okay. Thank you, Christophe. So, uh, if anybody, anybody else would like to add something. If you do, please do so on the mirror board or just insert in the chat box. We will move to the next question, okay? I've just inserted it in the chat box. It's about transport justice and social inclusion. Away from the city center, many suburbanites are either locked into car dependency and highly sensitive to restrictions or captive users of public transport who dream of buying a car. Accelerating the shift to sustainable mobility requires providing these populations with affordable options. Emphasis on affordable. What are the converging interests, conflicting, and what advice do you have? Anybody would like to start? Is it a tough question or there are no conflicts involved? Mm -hmm. so, so here I'm singing on something. So uh, in, in, especially in the US, uh, there are some cities with uh, communities of concern, so areas where, where the city would like actually to, to, to do better things by, in, by, by giving access to the mobility solutions to, to do it. To do, oh, sorry to those uh, 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 communities and areas. And uh, so there are different possibilities to do that so by in incentivizing uh, the, 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 the different ticketing and, and the transport. So that, that, that's, that there, is, there is a converging interest there for sure between operators and the city because they, 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 they are incentives. When, when it's in place, they are incentives and, and everybody is, is happy and everybody would like to say, uh, especially from a pure private, private perspective that, hey, we are doing something for those communities, for those specific four areas. Um, so so that, 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 that's what's coming to my, my mind right now uh, in terms of, of accessibility and trans, transport or social inclusion, which, which I think is the case here. Um, but, okay. Yeah. Um, Christina? Uh, for, from my end, um, looking at the negative side again, um, one of the I, I think one of the things that unfortunately we see a lot is that it's not actually just enough to um, make it more affordable because I, I think in a lot of places public transport 
is always more affordable. Anything is really more affordable than having a car. And so the difficulty is that, or I suppose the reality is that you just need to make it um, much more difficult. You have to like increase the friction um, that makes it just very painful <laughs> to, to, to have a car. Um, and from a political standpoint, that often, you know, uh, politicians or um, cities are often much less willing to do that when from my point of view is, you know, operators, you know, if there are multiple ones in a city or, or, or if there's just one, we will always struggle um, to a certain extent until um, we have a fair playing field with cars uh, in the sense of, you know, actually making it um, more, more difficult to drive and such. And so I think that's, um, that's a big, conflict here i mean it's not necessarily a direct conflict but in essence it limits the 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 ultimate um potential of uh you know a, a bike share or a micro mobility system in general or or also you know um motorized mass uh transport as well um because ultimately it's still easier or it's just not as hard um to use a car Although, I, to, to be fair, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that overlaps with the comment on, on social inclusion. I mean, the, the reality is that a lot of areas that could benefit the most from um, public transport are just, public transportation is not there, whether that be, you know, bike share or frequent buses or whatever it may be. And so, uh, but it's also the reality that those areas may not bring in as much revenue. And so cities need to subsidize those operations um, to be able to offer those areas just as good coverage and just as good access as the other areas. Yeah, because areas well served by public transport, land is usually more expensive. So they don't, it doesn't, you know, basically attract lower income population. Mm -hmm. Yes, Martin, you were moving your finger because you want yeah. to say something? Uh, I, I was wondering if, if um, so I, I, I got the argument, but I think it's it's not a conflicting interest. <laughs> I think it's a converging interest because so all, all actors uh, offering um, uh, any kind of mobility service are interested that uh, it, uh, car use and car ownership should be higher text or should be uh, not as easy as it is today. So I think we all would like to see uh, uh, more restrictions on, on private car use and private car ownership. And, and so I think that's a converging interest and to, to have a more transport justice means uh, to reduce the number and the use of cars. And um, so I I mm -hmm. think <laughs> I got the argument, but I think it's in the wrong uh, section here. So No, but it's okay. So what mm -hmm. you're saying is that uh, all actors offering any kind of mobility services do really have an interest in uh, getting people away from private car ownership yeah. and use. Does everybody agree? Does everybody have a different opinion? <laughs> or would every, anybody want to build on that? Is that the interest? I mean, that's maybe it's a stated yeah, interest. That's definitely a shared, a shared converging interest, getting people away from their yeah. from private car ownership. I, I think, sorry, I think to, to Bonnie's point is, yes, that's the stated interest, whether or not they, you know, everybody, all politicians in the world are like, yeah, everybody should bike and walk more, whether or not they actually implement the policies and the infrastructure that allows people to, to bike and walk more, I think is a, is a totally different, um, uh, it's not necessarily, like, because it's just not that easy, right? And so I think that's kind of the distinction is on the surface, yes, it, we are all technically working towards the same thing, but in terms of implementation, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm severely disappointed in most cities. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting point that, for example, when you look at the unit economics of shared micromobility, uh, you know, for example, e-scooters, uh, you know, they say that, you know, an e-scooter should be used at, used at least for three rides per day to at least uh, meet um, the costs. Whereas, I mean, if you would have the e-scooter in a less denser area, for example, in the suburbs, 
where a person would use the shared e-scooter to go from the home to the PT, to the public transport hub, and then in the end of the day, back home, there'll be two trips. I mean, doesn't meet the three trips threshold, but they would be longer trips, and that person would be, you know, making the first buy right at the beginning of the day. So there would be, you know, a different commercial perspective there. And you don't see many of these, um, you don't see, you know, you see what, what I see, you know, from talking to cities, you see, you know, most of the shared micromobility operators, you know, having their eyes stuck in the center of cities where, you know, people can walk and there's already public transport and very few are looking at the suburban areas where people do have to walk to public transport or, you know, you know, leaving their car home to, to, to walk to, to, to take public transport still implies walking a lot. And they don't have these uh, private alternatives. So are there any more thoughts there? Yeah, I would heavily agree on that because so every operator would, uh, would operate there where, where the uh, highest density and the most affluent uh, population. So, so usually um, all mobility services tend to not to operate in the lower income, less dense uh, areas where there might be the, the biggest necessity in terms of, of uh, transport justice. So uh, that's definitely um, um, a conflict, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think to that point is this, this though is a fundamental failure of cities not valuing bike share and you know well i will speak for bike share not valuing bike share correctly and not understanding that it's similar to other forms of public transportation you do have so to subsidize certain routes in certain areas um and that if all you're going to do is is um you know, uh, allow a certain company in and then they they take all the operational risk, then yeah, it, it becomes really difficult to operate in um, certain areas. And so cities need to put their money where their mouth is. You know, there are some cities that do the model kind of a, a bit more of an in-house model where they're paying um, the oper uh, the operators to operate in certain areas and, and they cover the, they subsidize it. Um, but that's a more generally a more progressive city um, that understands that um, companies also need to, you know, cover their bottom line and, and um, cover their costs. And if the only way to do that, do that is to only operate in the center, then that's what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Great. We've been Thanks. talking about bike share quite a bit. I'm thinking about others like um, ride hailing services and that sort of thing. Um, just coming back to this point of, of whose interest is it or, or um, there's a, a shared interest of people getting out of cars. But um, I think it's also been seen that for some ride hailing services, maybe it's just a question of getting customers regardless of where they come from. And that could also be from public transport. Hmm. Any thoughts on this? Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's probably a conflict. And also when, when you look at all the, who is uh, using ride hailing services, uh, it's, it's not the lower income people. So it's, uh, so in, when you look at the data from the United States, it's a uh, pretty well earning. So much above the, the average uh, earning people. So it's, it's, it's not a, a solution for everyone, but, but for the more rich and affluent, uh, people, so I think so. The the commercial ride hailing is uh, is is not part of transport justice. Maybe it can be when it is integrated in public transportation, so it uses lower fares or set fares, and or is coordinated with uh, fixed route uh, transportation. But it depends on on the model. But when you look at the different actors, so I think the ride hailing or at at as all all the other providers, if they are working on their own uh, income and have commercial services, they they would not uh, feed too much into uh, transport justice, but into okay. where the market is. <laughs> yeah, let's thanks, Martin. Let's 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 move on to the next question, which pretty much uh, let's seg into the to the next question. 
which is about protecting and serving the backbone. The backbone, you know, here in Brussels, uh, it's, you know, in elsewhere, it's said that, you know, public transport is the backbone. So mass public transport carries large numbers of passengers, has deep influence in land use, and as became evident during the pandemic, is what keeps running when everybody folds their business and leaves. Um, so it's the backbone of urban mobility, but it has its limitations regarding capillarity, you know, meaning, you know, serving lower density areas where it's just not, you know, uh, sustainable economically to run a bus um, and uh, in off peak periods. Now, uh, Martin, picking up on what uh, Martin and Christina said, uh, Martin mentioned, you know, commercial ride hailing is not part of transport justice, but maybe when it's integrated in the public transport system. And uh, Christina made a, a very interesting remark regarding, you know, we should look at uh, bike sharing as one type of uh, public transportation. So can these, uh, you know, new mobility services help us uh, reach those places where public transport is in getting to um, and where people, you know, feel either obliged to get on a car or just, you know, suffer the the commute and walk under the rain and at night to, to, to the bus stop. I'm thinking, for example, if I may uh, put a, a specific example on the table, I'm thinking of uh, some time ago, I did some uh, research with, um, with uh, in, in a social neighborhood uh, where, you know, uh, women who work, as, who work in the cleaning industry come back home, uh, are either coming home at 1.30 a.m in the nightline bus, which drops them far away from their home, or are walking to the bus stop at 5 a.m. to go start cleaning the, the office buildings before people start pouring into the office. I mean, this was some time ago, but the question remains. I mean, how do we, can we use new mobility services to improve public transport service? How can we do that? And what's your advice? Yes, Martin, please. Yeah, I would. Uh, um, I think that the, the main story is that people need to have a, um, a more versatile uh, offer of public um, mobility. And I always see that you need a kind of a mixture of fixed route traffic, uh, car sharing, bike sharing, uh, ride hailing, and so on. And and, and all the, the examples of um, where it's... it's um, where, where is it successful to get people away from owning and using a private car? That's exactly these areas where you have good public transportation and you have also good other mobility services. And altogether, they form a, a real alternative to the private car. And so I think, uh, so I see mostly converging interests in in between all the mobility providers because all, all together they form a kind of an, um, a versatile uh, offer. And, and I, I myself, I would like to get away a little bit of just filling gaps of public transportation or just being first mile, last mile provider. No, it's, it's mostly sometimes you want to be in a car or as you mentioned at nighttime. So, but, but that's an option. So you can decide, am I going by Tran by transit or by taxi or by bike or what and people need choices and uh, so that, that's my basic story to have people making to, to have alternative to the private car means uh, offering choices and not to um, just have one solution for for that fits everything or, um, or, or only that fills gaps for, for public transportation mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin. Who else wants to go? Oh, yes, I have a comment. Uh, a good solution can be the demand response. If public transport in the outskirts and on the edge of the city, in Budapest we have seven lines uh, with areas where there are not so many people, so especially after 9 p.m. and before 6 a.m. Uh, it's uh, very useful and it also can provide a solution for your example that a uh, worker has to work a lot for the bus stop uh, in the night time in the dark uh, because there is no need for dedicated bus stops uh, it's possible or, or 
there can be bus stops uh, in every 100 meters and the, the bus only stops where the passengers want to get on or drop off and you can choose the stop uh, in your mobile device or you can discuss it with the driver. Demand responsive transport. So that would involve, uh, this is public-led demand responsive transport or this is uh, a way for to bring in uh, new mobility services? And Actually, both, both one uh, is a solution. In Budapest now we operate it on a public basis. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's better to, again, operate the entire system as, as public transport um, with private partners in order to be able to, to fill all those needs. And even if you can't run a bus system at that time, is maybe be able to provide more than one option than just um, bikes or walking or, yeah, some more demand responsive type stuff. And um... Would this, uh, would this, you know, framework of, uh, you know, providing the entire system as public transport with private uh, operators coming in to fill the needs? So I wonder if that would provide these, uh, these well, private providers with this, with some sort, with the stability and reliability of demand that some of them, I think, crave for. Do you feel so? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a, a really important bit is, um, I suppose, when I mean, when at least when, when I mean it uh, under the umbrella of public transport is, yeah, fundamentally, it's subsidized and, and may, maybe it makes a profit, who knows, but it's subsidized um, by the city. The city also receives, you know, a majority of the customer revenue. And so it ensures that the private operator um, can continue to operate you know, in whatever the financial circumstance might be, um, because it's part of the, the general system and doesn't have to make decisions only based upon um, the exact finances. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you like to add something, Christoph, or any of the other colleagues, Valerio, Vasilis, Yannick, Pingen, Carlin, Marisa, Giant, Celeros, Pasquale? Or are you okay with the discussion so far? Would you like to any anything on this? I think that reliability stuff that Krisha is sort of touching on um, yeah. becomes important. I mean, if you've got a public or a private operator that's op offering a service that people come to rely on, and then at some point they say, mm, not making a profit, sorry, I'm out of here. Um, then you've left people who were relying on that service with nothing. So there's this question of, I mean, if they're offering a service for the public, you need to have some sort of guarantee that it will be there over a longer time period. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And, and especially when you want to uh, tackle car ownership. So people would only give up their own car if it's reliable and it will be there for years and, and also take years to change your mobility behavior. So it could be subsidizing uh, services but, or contracting services, but also to have obligations that like in the taxi industry, they're obliged to to operate in the whole city and not only in the core area. So, but they are not subsidized. So that's part of the uh, licensing scheme. Mm -hmm. But maybe one general idea. So um, I think, so I don't like the idea of subsidizing every kind of service and contracting it or, and, and, or although I'm working with public transportation, not everything has to be part of the public transport system. And I think the less uh, cities are car friendly and the more you tax on car ownership and car uh, user usage, the more money is there for other mobility services and the more people are using it, the better the services are get going to be. So in my view, um, it, it should be uh, able, uh, uh, or providers should be able to provide different kinds of services uh, on a commercial basis, but that needs a transformation of the city. So you don't give free parking to the people or free use of 
the the uh, streets but but when you do have uh, restrictions on car use and car ownership uh, people spend a lot of money on transportation so and you just shift part of the pie from the private car ownership to uh, that that can be spent for mobility services so I, I would like to get away a little bit of uh, we need to subsidize everything no we we have to reduce subsidizing uh, private cars and the uh, private car use so that's that's what we do with the public money we subsidize the wrong things <laughs> And once we stop it, so other services should be able to uh, to be operated commercially. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like, to put it another way, it's a bit like, uh, you know, decades of, uh, you know, we've created some sort of, there's some sort of monopoly of private mm. cars over the urban mobility system. And this quasi monopoly is really stopping the uh, delaying or blocking the growth of yeah. new types of mobility offers. Absolutely. Interesting point yeah. of view. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Would somebody like to add something on this? We've kind of, we've kind of squeezed the orange. If you want to come back, uh, please uh, let us know or in the chat box or in the Miro board. So I will enter the last question. Uh, we've got 10 minutes for this. Uh, fair labor practices. So some new mobility services uh, have been created by highly qualified tech professionals that have generous pay uh, and bonus benefits, but are at the same time generating thousands of low pay, no benefit, individual entrepreneurs, as they call them. This uh, externalization of labor, of labor costs, which is what it is, provides these new mobility services a competitive advantage but there are side effects, you know, what are the side effects for the transport sector and who deals with them? Who would like to start? First of all, let me ask you a question. I mean, as transport professionals or stakeholders from the professionals from the transport sector, do you feel this is a relevant issue or, you know, it's, it's a labor issue that has to do with transport? Any views on that? To me, it's, um, it's not the biggest issue and things what we are discussing with cities or, or listening to, to, to date. So, but uh, uh, really taking into account what, what, I, what I really uh, I contemplate and, 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 and be aware of. So in, in the US, there are some more expectation than that compared to Europe, um, but uh, but it, it, it's, I mean, if you look at some RFPs or cities that are asking for some, I think even the rating of the points you can get is not that crazy, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's quite an important one, I suppose, just from a, um, a values perspective. Um, you know, in the UK, there are conversations, yeah, that are happening, uh, I would say spe more specifically around certain um, food delivery companies that it's, it's been highlighted right now. Mm. Um, similar, I think, to the US ones where basically, yeah, it's, it's you're, you're using gig workers, you're not paying them enough. Um, and that's how you're being competitive. Um, I, I haven't had those conversations with cities, but also all of our employees are in-house. So, so maybe that's also why I think um, something on tenders that is starting to come up is um, cities at least asking um, what kind of wages are you paying? Are you doing the, the minimum wage? Are you paying in the UK? There's the, um, oh, sorry, I'm blanking, but basically the, um, living wage foundation rates that uh, an organization is encouraging and um it, it's definitely being encouraged i don't know how much it's being graded so to speak in terms of tenders but um i think it looks good and we should encourage companies to um, be paying people living wages um and, and ultimately again it comes down to legitimizing public transportation um and making sure that financially yeah, we've structured the system. I mean, to your point, yes, not subsidizing cars so that we can spend that money on public transportation and also, yeah, pay people a living wage. 
Uh, I mean, uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point, actually. Uh, 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 but so just to give you an example, so um, one of the last uh, RFPs that, that we won in, in, in London with TFL, uh, they, they were really asking, uh, OK, uh, uh, it, it was not a, a crazy criteria to, uh, to, 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 to mention that actually we are paying all the staff uh, in the UK uh, at the minimum wage, but we had to certify that we were doing it and that we were meeting actually in London, the minimum wage in London, because that one is a little bit different compared to, uh, to, uh, to, to the rest of the UK. But once again, uh, it's, it's the, even the minimum wage in London, if I'm not wrong, is 24,000 pounds, something like that. So, I mean, it's pretty hard to live at 24,000 pounds if you live in London. Um, and, one, and so uh, we had to certify. Once, once we, we have been in contract with you, we had to certify. But it's, we, we never, I never see a city so far asking for the list of the employee with the salaries and saying, hey, here, this is the proof of what we're doing and what we're saying. But it's right um, that that kind of minimum wage is, is, is something that some cities are, are, are asking uh, in terms of certification. Mm -hmm. But let me, let me ask you a question. So when we talk about, um, so when we talk about these, um, you know, a new mobility service company uh, coming in uh, and externalizing the labor costs, meaning if you don't have employees, uh, then you're not paying for their social security. I mean, you're paying exclusively for the hours of work they perform. Uh, you're not paying for their downtime, meaning the time they're waiting for clients. You're not paying for their social costs. You're not paying for their vacation. So um, that way, and I'm not, make, I'm not trying to make a point or to defend yeah. something. I mean, I have my opinion definitely, but that's not the point. The point is, from a structural perspective, and that's why I'm trying to take the discussion to, from a structural perspective, that provides the company that does that with a, you know, with a highly competitive advantage over any other company that's operating, you know, with a, in, a, in, a, in a regulated uh, manner. And so that has an impact in the performance of the mobility system. Now, my point is actually twofolded. On the one hand, that creates the risk, you know, of creating like a, a rush to the bottom. Like it pushes uh, all the prices down and gets all these companies, you know, in a spiral of, you know, fighting to the fighting to zero, which has other repercussions for uh, the transport offer. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, you know, other implications in the way the service is promoted, the quality, the safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there are different angles we could, we could discuss here. My, my point is, you know, what is there, is there something that you see from your experience? Is there some implication that you can see down the road? Uh, there is something that is sure is that there are always, uh, uh, almost always, uh, additional uh, uh, points to get if you are saying that you are going to hire people on site within the city, you are going to deliver the service. That, and you're getting good points for that, actually. And it can be big uh, in the UK, in the US. Uh, I've never seen in France so far, but, uh, but there is a possibility to, to get at, out of 100 points, you can get an additional 20. So it's pretty big, actually, if you send. It's very rare that actually people are able to actually set up a, a, a directly a, a big staff member on site, at, but, but it, it can happen. And in that case, cities like likes it, appreciate it. They know that maybe it's an additional cost. If this is the chance that you have your HQ there, like, like in, in big cities, like in London, then it's, it's all good for you as well. Uh, so, I mean, in that perspective, we can say that some large cities they, and, and transport uh, 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 authorities uh, can pay or are ready to pay an extra somehow to, to, to support companies or services that are investing within the city. So that we, we can see it um, for sure. Okay. Yeah. I, sorry, if, if I can build upon that, I think um, your example actually, especially I think in... Um, micromobility in the UK at the moment, you can really extend that example out 
to everything that certain companies are able to subsidize because they have you know, venture capital or a lot of external money. And I think that's actually one of the big problems in the uh, micromobility world, that there are a lot of different types of companies. Well, well there, there are a couple main different types of companies. So there are companies that have um, significant uh, e external funding and therefore even the equipment, right? They can provide equipment for free. Um, and that does distort the market. And um, I mean, I, it's, it's, a, it's a general question, right? Like, sh do we want this much external money flowing into cities? And, and some cities have no funding um, and would never maybe be able to do it unless they reprioritize things. So I, I think sometimes it can be a, a hard question for cities, but I think it's a, it's a question that goes beyond just the, the labor market and also goes to what else companies sometimes um, subsidize or, uh, you know, quote unquote, sell to the city for zero, which is a, that then is another race to the bottom um, for certain types of companies. So I, I think it's a, it's a larger problem than just the labor bit. Um, but obviously the, the labor bit is very, you know, human rights, social justice centered as well. So um, very important as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a larger problem than just the labor bit, meaning you know this uh, these distortions either by the externalization of labor costs or by just basically burning through venture capital. There's no tomorrow, and maybe there isn't. <laughs> Creates these distortions in the market that really um, maybe I would say I would ask. I mean, in, in this context, are we really promoting? Are we really have? Are we really promoting the fittest? If we leave the market to these behaviors, are, are, can we expect the fittest to emerge, or just you know the most um, the uh, with the deepest unbalanced pockets. players? Yeah, the ones with the deepest pockets. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's exactly the point. Is it uh, you know as long as you have the money and you can offer everything for free, um, then it does create a highly unfair advantage. Um, you know, and sometimes maybe those companies are the best companies, who knows, but um, when you're looking at it purely on a cost basis, it, it's, um, it's not a fair playing field and it's not necessarily you don't end up choosing um, the best player. Now, to be fair, I do think um, more recent tenders, at least in the UK in bike share, they, they put a lower uh, quality or a lower rating or weighting on price, but price is still in there. And obviously to a certain extent, it absolutely makes sense, but it's how, as a city, how do you make sure that you're not unfairly advantaging a company just because they have money and not necessarily money because they operate really efficiently or are very sustainably, you know, financially and that kind of stuff. So I think it, it, it's tough from a city perspective as well, but I think it's something that definitely um, sh should be considered. Okay. Would like would somebody like to add something before we finish the discussion? I got one thing. Yes, so maybe, I, or I think there's a distinction between uh, what is the company doing. So on one hand, you have some providers that provide shared bikes or other kinds of services. So which is more or less a, a um, a, a private business, they run a private business and they can uh, do it with the rules that they uh, set up their, uh, themselves. But on the other hand, you have these uh, transport services like uh, um, yeah, um, uh, ride hailing, ride sharing and so on. And so in a lot of countries, like in Germany, for example, that's considered to be a business. So you are not allowed to have a commercial transport uh, service operated with unpaid people or like like this Uber style uh, service. So that's strictly forbidden in, in a country like Germany. So and I think that's a that's one step uh, towards a, a distinction of services. So and um, so the, the public hand can just for um, uh, restrict or um, yeah, you know, um, prohibit uh, companies to provide services with with volunteers or these not not gig workers, but 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 people who who are making or 
bike bike money or it's, it's it's unofficial work <laughs> like like Uber you did. You want to say entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. Okay, thanks a lot. So uh, we basically reached the end of our uh, discussion this afternoon. I'm going to hand over the session to Bonnie. If you want to add something at the Myro board, please go ahead. If you want to add something on the, if you're Myro board challenged like me, please feel free to use the chat box. And if something occurs to you uh, later today or in your sleep, do reach out with an email either to me or Bonnie and we're most happy uh, now or in the future, forevermore to listen to your opinions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Pedro. Um, I'm actually going to, I don't know if anybody feels like it, but just in case I will send the mirror board links um, to you and you're welcome to take a look at it afterwards or add something if you want to. So <clears throat> I'll do that right away, but there certainly are lots of interesting discussions and points around this that we think about, you know, regulating new mobility, hard, how hard can this be? But when you realize even within a particular industry, and we can see um, Chris's example with the bike sharing, there's bike sharing and then there's bike sharing. They're the ones that drop thousands of cheap bikes on the street. And then they're the ones that have an actual business model behind it that um, finances itself. So how to then regulate those um, fairly is a real challenge. And I mean, it sounds like Christia, the, the cities are recognizing that a little bit and that they're, they're putting their calls for tenders out maybe with less focus on the, on the, um, on the price and considering other aspects, but, um, but it's a challenge. And this is, a, you know, we come up with the same thing in every other new form, form of new mobility that, um, that it's not all created the same. So, um, you're pointing out, man, Christoph, you're a busy man. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, it's nonstop today. <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time for us. Um, yeah. So, but again, thank you for for sharing your thoughts and your ideas on these on these four specific topics that we have. There, are, I mean, the discussion could go on and on in a lot of different directions, but we'll have to cut it off now. There's always always has to be an end. Um, as I said, I'll send the Miro board link around and um, all of you, I know we've invited to the session on Thursday afternoon, where we'll be um, summarizing basically the knowledge that we've got out of the, all the various different sessions. So that's just us sort of feeding back to you what came out of this session from today. There was a morning session as well, and also ses sessions tomorrow and Thursday morning. So we've, we're pretty busy for the rest of this week with different things. Um, Actually, I'll just put it out. If anybody is interested in participating in another discussion, we have um, tomorrow taking place as well. You're welcome to stay on the line with us for a minute and um, I can give you links. I can send you invitations for tomorrow. We're talking about um, challenges towards, or let's see, developing a roadmap towards well-regulated new mobility and the challenges we face getting there. So if that sounds interesting to you, um, I'd be happy to invite you to come to one of our discussions tomorrow. But I think that's all for the moment. So I'd just like to say, um, repeat what Pedro said, thank you very much for um, allowing us to <laughs> squeeze the orange juice out of your brains. Um, we hope you also gathered something from others and from the input as well from the discussion. And um, if we see you on Thursday, which would be great, we look forward to that. And otherwise, I'll just say, have a nice evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Nice to see you again. Hey, Tamash. Take care. <laughs>